mosques and the cathedrals and, and the temples and finally there's so much technology and the potential of what you can do with the knowledge we have is so high that it said you know we not only could take care of getting everybody into the afterlife but we also have enough capability to take care of the king in this life so that brought about the moment we call the divine right of kings so there was not only he didn't really have to wait until he got into the next world before we began to do quite a lot for him. Still further multiplication then of the capability, because this is a, a, a multiplicative regenerativity of tools, beginning concepts of tools, so that the Leonardo type tends to think in those tools. So it finally has so much know-how, so many tools that said, not only can we take care of getting everybody in the afterlife, but we can also take care of the king in this life and also the nobles. That's the Magna Carta time. Tools keep on multiplying even more. Finally we get to say we take care of the afterlife of everybody and the life of the king and the nobles. Now we can also take care of the rich middle class. That brings you to what we call the Victorian period, a very, very recent in our history. In fact, I was born just at the tail end of the Victorian period in 1895. Then we came to, in this 20th century, there's so much tool proliferation, there's such an environmental stimulation of awareness of tools that we have a Henry Ford. We have a Henry Ford really getting the point where he said, we now have the capability not only to get everybody in the afterlife, but we can take care of everybody in this life too. This brings about a really very different kind of idea. And uh, that, that is now, for instance, in my own life, I found myself tremendously inspired by the realization that of what was going on in our technology. As, for instance, the fact that we were, in my birth time, looking upon phenomena where we said, reality is everything you can see, smell, touch, and hear. When I was three, the electrons discovered, the year I was born, x-rays discovered. But they didn't make the newspaper, nobody knew those were going to be anything. We get into a new world and of that electronics, we get into the new world of discovering the radio and all the different lengths of frequencies, of wavelengths of electromagnetic waves. We gradually discover early in the century that the, each of the chemical elements when incandescent in a arc flame give off light, which light if it's led through a prism is, is then broken down into spectrum bands and the spectrograph camera can photograph and the chemical emulsion of photography can see frequencies that your eye and my eye cannot see so they make black bands. We found that every chemical element had its own unique set of frequencies so that once you knew, knew that and no other, no other chemical element has those frequencies. You're able to identify when it's taking light, we say, from a distant star. You can tell how many chemical elements are in that star just by identifying those light bands. And then this brought about what you might call the total electromagnetic spectrum. 1930, for the first time in history, we have a publishing of the great electromagnetic spectrum by the Westinghouse Company. They, there have been all kinds of individual scientists keeping track of this set of events and that set of events. But this is the most first comprehensive where it started with the mile-long radio waves of World War I, which got shorter and shorter. We learned how to use shorter wavelengths and so forth. And the, we gradually get then all these things are invisible. We go through many of the chemical elements and we suddenly come to infrared and then red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, where you and I can tune in. Then we go in ultraviolet and out, and on it goes. And as of 1930, it was manifest to us that what, what is reality, because all these chemical elements were reality. The fact that we, you, our, our iron, were not tuned to see those frequencies, for us not to be able to see what's going on in the radio waves with our eyes. Then we thought that really the old way of looking at it wasn't real if you couldn't see it but I'm saying now we suddenly discovered in 1930 that 
99.9% of reality is no longer directly contactable, apprehendable by the human senses. This is a very, very big jump. Now, France society hasn't thought about that, and society carries on exactly as if that were not true, and the newspapers still deal in the just see it, smell it, touch it, and, and hear it. So I, I find a reality we're, we're carrying on in a, in a shrunken little bit of reality in relation to a very extraordinary new aspect of the universe which is available to us, but it's invisible, therefore you only tend to feel that you can deal with it by through some kind of scientific training and some kind of capability to deal with instruments, then maybe you can penetrate into that, that, that invisible world. But I point out that today we have any, any place you might be around the world, if you had two million wideband radio sets with you, you could tune each one on a different program for any place around the world today. There are more than two million programs that are in the air but not tuned in, therefore absolutely invisible and silent to you and I. But if you tune in on them, you could tune all of those two million sets and each in a different program, they're all there. There are programs that are right in this room and two million programs right here. <laughs> two million programs going through your head right now. So if you had the right equipment in your head, you could pick up any one of them if you wanted to tune in on them. I find this brings you, gives me a very different kind of feeling about life. The, feeling I get is, is the following. I find that humanity using the words up and down, which have no real meaning. Up and down were invented to accommodate the misconception that Earth, the our light world was a flat plane going to infinity. A flat plane to infinity, all the perpendiculars to it are parallel to one another. So all the trees and all the other people all perpendicularly said to the same plane, and therefore there are only two directions up and down. <laughs> the minute you realize you're on a sphere, none of the radii of the sphere, all of which are perpendicular to the sphere, are parallel to one another. And all of us today know that we've got many of our, we have, all of us have friends all around the world today, and we know that our friends, they're, they're not upside down. That uh, the words upside down have absolutely no meaning. There is no up in the universe, there's no direction called up. Our earth is continually revolving. So you say, which town are you pointing to when you said that was up? Because pretty soon, it's only 12 hours and now it's going to be in the direction of your feet. So uh, there's no up and down in the universe. So you say, what are the right words to use? And the aviators learned to say long ago, you come in for landing and you go out instead of up and down. So in and out of, and around are the right words of direction. And in, you can point, is, into, in is always pointable. You can point, you can go into the moon or into the earth or into Mars. Out is any direction. You can go in through, through the earth, go out on the other side. Out is any direction. Very interesting, in and out are, are not opposite kind of things. They have one that's very specific, the other's absolutely broadcast. So, I find that we begin to use the words in and out instead of up and down. Then we get into the language of electromagnetics, because you tune in and you tune out. This begins to get you in a another way of looking at things, because in the old world of up and down, you had things and you had space. When I get into the electromagnetic world, there's no such thing as space. <laughs> I simply have what I have tuned in now, and that's what we're conscious of, and I can tune it out and bring it back in again. <laughs> in other words, you begin to get quite a different idea of phenomena, what life and death may be whether it really has something to do with tunings and, and not to do with ups and downs and in and out. And it is to do with tuning in and tuning out. But that, when you tune out, it doesn't mean it's dead. <laughs> I want to understand that. I think that uh, I'm coming back to the my series of Leonardo types. Because we got down to where Henry Ford said, enough for everybody in this life. Then we began to think about the, the increase of capabilities that came with alloys and electronics where you continually did more with less. Nothing could be more impressive just than the computer world of the great big computers and smaller and then smaller and smaller and smaller, getting down where you can have it in your, in your ring and so forth. There's capability to do more with less. Begin to make it very clear that you can take care of everybody 
and I don't take care of them and take care of them. Everyone and ever higher standard of living. Now it's beginning to be really very evident. We can take care of all the generations to come. <laughs> and one of the things that's perfectly clear about this is that we find I've plotted curves and kept them very carefully of all the different birth rates in all the different countries around the world. I also keep curves of the rate of electrical energy consumption by each of the different economies. I find that the per capita energy consumption goes up in any country. The curve of the birth rate is exactly the opposite. As, as, as the energy consumption goes up, the birth rate goes exactly down, just re strictly reflection pattern of it. We're at a point now where Russia, United States, Japan are all on a negative level. We are not producing more children at all. So I say, as we industrialize, we begin to find this technology of learning that know-how, that scaffolding in this life, makes it possible then to cut down the birth rate. And this is a very fundamental way. The nature, when her, she has important functions to perform in the universe, and the trees have extraordinary important functions. And the trees then, their function is to impound the sun radiation by photosynthesis. And they have to have roots so they can do it. Because <laughs> otherwise they couldn't expose all that leafage to the great winds. <clears throat> they have to be able to get water out of the ground to, to keep, to just, just hold their shape. They have to have water then to keep them from dehydrating with all that radiation. They have to get water in the sky to rain back on them. So the root, trees have to have roots. Therefore, they can't go out and plant their seed. And the function of their seed is going to be to impound the sun radiation. So they've got to get the seed out from under the shadow in order to function. So we find every tree giving off 100,000 little flying machines, little gliders, the beautiful seeds in them, hoping that some of them are going to get out where they'll land in a place that is favorable. So when, this is a very important function. When nature has an important function, the chances of survival of the progeny are poor. She then makes more, many, many starts. And I'm, I'm assuming she needed human beings very, very badly as the chances of life success go up, down, go the birth. Absolute perfect curve. So I, I can now really say it's coming in evidence that we're not going to, going to be able to take care of all the people that are alive, but all the people to come. The kind of things I begin to say to you then begin to make something else very clear because we learn more and more about our physical universe. When I was 28, Hubble discovered another galaxy. We now have discovered two billion such galaxies. The range of our information.